Welcome to the gathered body of Jesus Christ in Cape Coral, Florida on this first Sunday after Christmas, the second day of Christmas, as it were. We wish to welcome those of you who are visitors in our midst, and we want you to know there are no strangers in the household of God, but only brothers and sisters whom we have not yet met. And so, so as we go forth in this time of prayer and praise and worship of Almighty God, we invite you to join your hearts and your voices together with ours as we raise them to God, our Creator. Before I begin our formal worship service, I, 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 we don't have any visitors today. All the visitors are visiting elsewhere. <laughs> but in any case, we're, we're gathered here on, on this, on this uh, second Sunday of Christmas. And I suppose we're all familiar with the 12 days of Christmas. The Christmas season lasts from Christmas Day to the day of Epiphany, which is 12 days later at January 6th. And so the, the tradition of singing the carol, the 12 days of Christmas, actually began in England in, in the 1850s and 60s because it was actually started by Roman Catholics who lived in England. And after the, after the, the Queen Mary uh, was thrown out of office, who had been Catholic, the Catholic people were were undercover, really. They had to go in hiding because the Protestants, loving as they were, were trying to drive them out. And so they couldn't have open worship services, the Roman Catholics, and so they developed this catechism using the Christmas carol, the 12 days of Christmas. And so the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree, which was the idea on the first day of Christmas, God gave his Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we, when we hear that, that's the, the, the opening verse. And the second, on the second day of Christmas, God gave me two turtle doves, which, which in their catechetical teaching was the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it goes on and on. Each, each day has a particular relationship with a doctrine of the church that reminds us the, the, the four Gospels and the 12 disciples, and we go on and on and on. And, and so on this second day of Christmas, we're focused primarily on the, the, the scriptures, as it were. How, how are the scriptures to, to inform our lives? And so as we go, as we go through this, this Sunday, uh, we're reminded of the, of the necessity of the scriptures in our life as we, as we attempt to follow this newborn Jesus now, as Jesus is, God is present in Christ, leading us toward a full relationship with God. And it, we can do nothing but be filled with joy, and so as we prepare to worship God, let us join our voices in the first verse of Joy to the World. Our responsive call to worship is found in our bulletin. Let us worship God of our mothers and fathers, God of our daughters and sons. Let us worship God as individual families and as the larger family of God. Let us nurture one another in Christian love. Let us join our hearts and voices in prayer. Most merciful God, 
you have been both a mother and father to us all, guiding and nurturing us to spiritual maturity. Teach us to encourage and support one another in our growth, that as many separate families and one big family, we may live and love as two true children of yours. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 123, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Please be seated. We now turn toward the work, the liturgy that God has set before us this day. And that work begins as we listen to God's address to us through the words of Holy Scripture. So I call upon our lector for our Old Testament lesson. Good morning. morning. Hannah was barren, but prayed to the Lord for a son and promised to dedicate him to the Lord. He grew up in the temple and found favor with God and played a key role in the transition from the period of the biblical judges to the institution of a kingdom under Saul and again in the transition from Saul to David. Reading from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, and verse 26. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year, his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, 
May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. The psalm we have in response is Psalm 148, and reading responsively. This is, this is a song of praise, obviously, as we read it for what God has done and continues to do in our lives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, who lies heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them from forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all beasts, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy winds fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. And in keeping with the, with the second day of Christmas theme, uh, it, as we understood the old, uh, the catechesis of the old 12 days of Christmas, the second day of Christmas is where we are, was the gift of the Old and the New Testament. We hear from the Old Testament in the reading from Samuel and from the reading, uh, our responsive reading of Psalms, and now we continue to hear God's address to us in the words of the New Testament that reminds us that, that God continues to be present with us always. Paul never visited Colossae, but while he was imprisoned, he heard that the Colossians were falling away from their faith and straying from their original teachings. This passage is not the admonishment that Paul has often delivered in his letters, but a beautiful synopsis of how to live in peace and love with others as Christ Jesus taught us. Reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude 
in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here ends the epistle reading. I love the story of Hannah. It speaks to her faith in God as she prayed for a son. Her prayers were answered, and then she dedicated her beloved child, Samuel, to the Lord. But her story does not end there. Every year, she and her family made a pilgrimage to Shiloh, and each year, as Samuel grew, she made him a new ephod, which is a sleeveless garment worn by Jewish priests and revered in ancient Israelic culture. This spoke to me as an incredible act of love, clothing her beloved son in love with a new garment. The reading from Colossians also speaks of clothing. It says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is Paul at his very best. Even though imprisoned in Rome, he speaks to Jesus' followers and exhorts them to love one another as Jesus taught him. I found in a concordance that love appears in the Bible at least 574 times and in 526 verses. There are four different kinds of love. Storge love is a natural familial love. Filial love is a positive emotion of regard and affection between friends, such as the brotherly love implied in the name of the city of Philadelphia. Eros love is a romantic love, such as the intimacy between a husband and a wife. And agape love is unconditional God love. Agape is one of several Greek words for love. When the word agape is used in the Bible, it refer refers to a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. It is the love of which Paul speaks in his letter to the Colossians, the love which Jesus taught us to practice every day. God is love, and God's gift to us in this season of Christmas is the gift of his son, who walked on the earth for a brief time. But in that time, he taught us how to love one another. It is truly the greatest gift we could ever receive. Christmas joy to you, and may it continue throughout the year.
This morning's gospel lesson is taken from the gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, beginning with the 41st verse. We, we travel quite quickly through the life of Jesus. On Christmas Eve, uh, we celebrated his birth. Yesterday on Christmas Day, we gathered to acknowledge that God's love was made manifest in our lives through the presence of this child in our life. And now we jump forward uh, 12 years in a day. Time goes by when you're having, or when you're in the presence of God or having fun. So we pick, we pick up the story now. Uh, much the same as Hannah and Elkanah were going to the temple for the annual sacrifice, we pick up the story where Joseph and Mary and family and all the families of, or some families from Nazareth had traveled from the northern part of Israel to Jerusalem to the temple for uh, the, the annual sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice, if you will. So we start, we pick up the story. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, and his mother stored all these things in her heart. Then Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and all people. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May it find a home in our heart and deepen our understanding that we might be drawn closer to God, our Creator, and through the Holy Spirit, closer to one another. Amen. Our human response is number 130, which is infant... If I could find it. There's too many papers I have here. I don't know how you do it in the, in the pews with all the... I don't know if I have it. I don't have it. Uh, I got a hymnal. Number 130. I know. <laughs> Too many papers. It's very complicated to be a Christian. And you're retired. Okay. Thank you. 
please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. During the season of Advent, we heard from the prophet John the Baptist that all people should repent and turn toward God. Repentance literally means turning from the way you're going to, to be facing toward God and journeying through life toward God. Most of the people, we don't know if all the people, but most of the people we can imagine who heard John the Baptist prophesy felt that they were in need of something. Their life was not going the way they wanted it to go. Some were outcast. Some were discriminated against because they weren't physically whole. They had some disability of some sort and were not included with everyone else. Some were excluded because they couldn't and didn't understand the law as well as some of the temple leaders. Many people were put upon because of the Roman overlords who had, who had taken political control of this land of the people of Israel. So they cried out. And God responded. The Messiah that people had longed for through all of the long ages from Abraham until the birth of Christ was fulfilled on that first Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. God came to dwell in the midst of the created order. God created all that is, including human beings, and invited and wanted nothing more than that God might be in relationship with something that's other than God. God does not need anything to be God. But God in love, this agape love that, that, uh, that uh, Maggie referred to. See, I knew, I, I knew that word. That, that, Maggie, that Maggie referred to. God did not have to create anything that was not God. But God in God's godness chose to do that. For you see, God is a God of love and relationship. We understand that God in the eternal relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This three intertwining being that is God. And God chose that there be something other than the divine God relationship to be in relationship with that God. So God created all that is. God spoke and it happened. We heard yesterday's reading that the word was with God and the word was God and nothing was created without the word of God. And we refer to Jesus as the word of God, God's address to us. Now, what is God saying to us in the birth of a baby? Now, think about that. What is this word that comes to you and to me every time we go through this cycle of Christmas? What is God saying? What do you want God to say to you? What do you want to hear from God? Well, if you're like me, I want to hear that I will have good health that I won't die, that the people I love will not leave me. That I will be able to exist in a world where I will be respected by everyone. 
I want to live in a world where I won't have any worries about whether I, what I'm going to sleep or whether I'm going to eat or what, what I will be able to do. I will be free. Now assume that every human being has that same desire. That God will come and invite them to be with God that they might experience this love of God. This freedom. Anxieties removed. Anxieties about any number of things we all worry about. Now, that's the God who comes in response to our prayers. Think about that. God comes into our life as a tiny child. Is that what I had in mind when I responded to the prophecy of John? turning toward God, and God responds to my prayers by sending a kid? What, is, what does God expect of me now? What does God expect of each one of us now? Not that God demands, but what, do, what is God expecting will happen in our lives as, as a result of coming into this created order in the person of... Now, God, God's self shows up in the midst of this created order. This is not some emissary. This is not some prophet. This is not some uh, creature, some created being. This is the very uncreated presence of God in our life in the person of this child. What might you imagine God expects us how does God expect us to respond to that? That's where we are today. Yesterday, we celebrated the birth of a Savior. Uh, Christmas Eve, we did. Yesterday, we kind of contemplated the idea that maybe God has come into our lives to show us the way to live toward God where we might be in this wonderful relationship of love that is evidenced in the loving relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You and I are invited to participate in that. We were created to participate in that, except what happened. Except as human beings, we grew up and assumed that we were going to be in charge of our lives, and as fortune would have it, we each think we should be in charge of other people's lives as well. And the whole purpose of being in charge of my life in the world is that I will live toward the promises of the world. What is, what is the world, this society, these cultures, what, is, what, what does the world promise you? If you want to know or catch a glimpse of what the pro world promises, turn on your television when you go home. Out of every half hour, what, 10, 12 minutes? are promises of how your life will be better. If you bought this pill, you bought that car, you owned that house, you had this labor-saving device, you had this uh, digital device or whatever. If you only had that, your life would be perfect. But you know that's not true. Since recorded history, Human beings have been lording it over one another, promising one another, trying to run one another's lives, that perfection might happen. Now, don't you imagine that after thousands of years of human history, we'd be a little closer? The world is not the final answer. The final answer is to be one in, in the community of the love of God. How do we get there? That's where Jesus comes in, the very word of God. How do we do it? What is expected of us? What, is, what does God expect? How, what, so uh, I acknowledge that Jesus is the, is the presence of God in my life. Now what? Isn't that enough? I confess Jesus Christ with my lips. Isn't that enough? Well, apparently not. 
because it would seem that God wants to come with us to invite us to turn from the ways and the promises of the world that lead to a certain death. There's no question about it. I don't care how wealthy you are, how much money you accumulate, how, how many homes you own, and how, how well you've prepared for the future, I will absolutely guarantee you that I will die. And so will you. Now, the world has no promises beyond death. God comes into this world with the same promise. No question. Everything in created order will end. But there's a second promise that God says, but you have the capacity to live forever. You won't die dead. You will die alive. Now, that's a terrible analogy to think about at Christmas, but it's the truth. We have the freedom to die alive. How do we do that? How did Jesus do that? Jesus is showing us the way that we might die alive. Because he's the one who did it. He starts by preparing himself to live as an adult. He's 12 years old. In Judaism, when you're 12, you go to Hebrew school. So you, at, when you turn 13, bat for girls and bar mitzvahs for boys that you know the laws or the will of God. And when you're bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed, that acknowledges, the community acknowledges that you are an adult and are responsible for your own life before God. Jesus is 12. He went to the temple to make the sacrifice. Sacrifice is over. We've done our Christmas duties. We've done our Easter duties. Whatever we do in church, we don't have to go anymore. That, that's enough of that. But Jesus stays behind. And he's sitting on the temple steps. Is a good Jewish boy. He's arguing with the rabbis. Now, argument in the sense not of anger, but argument in the sense of trying to learn and to understand how God would have us live. What is God, what is, how is God Describe that life in the Old Testament and how do, how, do the people, how do the people respond to that? It's a catechism. He's asking questions and God is answering through the voices of the temple teachers. What is he learning? What do you have to learn to be an adult in God's world? How are you supposed to live in this created order as a child of God? Do you have a rule book? How do you do it? How do we understand? The same thing happens when Hannah goes every year to the son that she dedicated to God's service, who was a priest, who, who spent his life approaching God on behalf of the people. Each year, as he grew in stature, she made a new garment to put on him as he grew in stature. Both Jesus and Samuel help us to understand that if we are going to be a citizen in the kingdom of God, to die alive, to live forever, then we ought to clothe ourselves in the garments of faith. If we go to the Old Testament, the garment of faith was the priestly garment where the priest went to God on behalf of the people and said, Oh God, be, be present in my people's life. And to show that they really want to do that, the priest would take the sacrifice of the people into the temple and God would see it and respond. But that didn't seem to be enough. For the people of Israel, like all human beings, were trapped in the world, not of their own making. The same as you and I are in this world that seems to have gone bug house on us. We don't. It doesn't make sense what's happening in the world. So God comes down and says, okay, 
I've tried to inform the people with my spirit, trying to show them, give them the words of life that they record in the Ten Commandments. I've given it to this group of people who are really of no account in the broader sense of the world, this tribe of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They really have, they're, they're not powerful, they don't have a great army. All they have is me. And they look out from where they are, and it's not enough. There's got to be more to life than this God thing. God comes in the person of Christ and said, no, there's not. There could be nothing more in your life than the one who created you and everything else. How do we live toward that God? Jesus begins to show us that way. God invites us to follow him as he matures in his faith. And at the end of Jesus' journey through life, where does he wind up? He doesn't stop at the cross. The cross is empty. He's not there. He's in the heavenly realm in this rightful relationship with God forever. And that's available to us. What do I have to do to do that? Listen to Paul. You have to clothe yourself in the Holy Spirit, which will help you inform your every action, every waking moment, your actions, the things that you do, and the person you are will be informed by the Holy Spirit. How do I get that? How did Jesus get that? By being in the presence of the very words of God in the text. Not, not as some literalist, but understanding the whole truth that God created each one of us to love us. But in order for love to be full, it can't just be God loving me. I also have to respond by loving God. But I only show forth my love for God as I love the things that God created. And that's everything that's not me. You mean I have to sacrifice my own self-interest by loving you but if I do that, who's going to love me? God says, your neighbor will. Love God with all your mind and all your strength and all your soul. And love your neighbor as you currently love yourself. That puts me third in line. That's all it takes to have peace in life eternal. Nothing tricky about it. Well, what does love look like? That's the rest of the story. That's why we continue reading this, the next story and the next story and the next story in our travel through the Bible each year. We learn and we see what the love of God looks like in the person and work of Christ. And as we walk through life journeying with him, we cannot help but be journeying back toward God instead of journeying toward the world and the promises they give. Can't I take a pill? Couldn't I have an injection? Maybe an infusion. Maybe a secret potion. No. Nope. Eternal life is only gained by living a life of love clothing yourself, it's impossible for me to do alone, but clothing myself in the Spirit. Now, where am I going to understand that I'm in the presence of the Spirit? You are in the presence of the Spirit when you are assembled in a community of people who are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, not only born yesterday, but resurrected on Easter. We are assembled in the presence of the very Word of God, and the Word of God goes forth, and with it the Spirit. That's all you need to do. 
and God will do the rest. Let us pray. Merciful God, give me the strength to receive the gift in response to my prayers. Give me the strength to continue to journey in the presence of your word that I, like that word, might mature in my understanding of your love. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, running over. For the love you give will be the love you receive. The morning offering will now be taken. Merciful God, we ask that you would pour your blessing upon these offerings, that they might be used to give light and love in your name. Amen. We now come to the time in our service where we share with one another life's joys and concerns. And I'll lead off. It's a great joy to be once again able to share God's word with you. And and it's it's an interesting uh, uh, observation I'll make. For 30 years I was here behind the pulpit proclaiming God's good news. And for the past year I've been back there with, with the choir proclaiming God's good news through song. And I'm not sure which one is the most difficult. <laughs> I, 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 
I suppose, a semi-snide remark this morning. Uh, in the choir, I said, you know, we, we spend a lot of time practicing in the choir for three minutes, basically, or four minutes of song. And, and we joke, or I do anyway, that we, we, in every practice, we hit the right notes, but not necessarily in the right time. <laughs> and we sometimes don't come in together but I can assure you that everybody who practices, their heart is there. And like, I thank my God for you. Now, we sang that, we've been practicing that for I don't know how long. And we sang it on the longest night service last Tuesday, and now we sang it today. And each time we sing it, not only, you can't sing it without having it in you. It, you it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing that I think every preacher should have to do, should have to sing in a choir, because it's, and I think every congregation, every, every one of you should try it. It's really a very interesting thing. It's, it's like learning to live as a Christian following Jesus. There's a language, there's a song, sing to the Lord a new song. There's a, a new song that we have to learn. Another sermon, never mind, next Sunday. But, <laughs> but the idea is that it's, it's a gift to do. It's not easy. In the choir, gosh, we spend how many hours? You know, an hour and a half a week, and then a half hour before church, and then an hour for church, and then you have to listen to me, and it goes on and on. It's a, it's a dedication, and I have a newfound appreciation for all of the work Helen has done through the last number of years. I, but I mean, to do that, it's really, it's, it's really a very interesting discipline to learn to sing and to sing in community. It's to learn to be a Christian in community. We all do it. And that's, that, that's a very interesting thing. So I, I thank the good Lord for, uh, for leading me in that direction too. Now, Nicholas is happy because Christmas is here, right? New Year's Day. Yeah, New Year's. Oh, you're going for New Year's. For New Year's. Yeah. You can't go for New Year's already, Nicholas. Yeah. <laughs> Tuesday, yeah, yeah, no, no, not Tuesday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Friday, 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 Friday is New Year's Day, Day. what day is it today, Sunday, yeah. yeah, okay, very good, but Nicholas, this is Nicholas's time of year, isn't it, Fred, yeah. Christmas is, this is, this is the best, very good, and I thank everybody who participated in the, in the pageant and yesterday and all the things leading up to it. Uh, let's see, who, who else has joys? Somebody must have a joy. No? Come on, you guys have a joy. Yeah, it's a joy to be here, right? I too was good to be here. Yeah, it is. It's always good to be with the church family. Exactly. Okay, how about concerns? We, I know we have people who, who are, are struggling that are part of our congregation, uh, Butch and Joanne Cox. I think Butch is in uh, rehab. He had, uh, I don't know, he, some infection, right? And, and, and our friend uh, Bob Hebner is at uh, Health Park. He's, he's in rehab too. Uh, Heartland, I'm sorry. Who else? We have others? Any 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 other people who who are struggling? This is this. Is. 
I'd like prayers for my friend Adam, who just turned 40 and found out he has ALS. Mm. We'll keep Adam in our prayers. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, we need to be mindful of is you see the, the, the chancel area is kind of bare without the presence of the poinsettias, but there just were no poinsettias available from the normal suppliers. And I know many people uh, gave poinsettias in memory of uh, that are recorded in the bulletin. And after talking with several people, it seems that maybe the best thing we could do with the money that was collected for flowers and poinsettias is contribute it to the one great hour of sharing for the tornado relief in Kentucky and Indiana and those places. That, that way, uh, in, in some way, the people, we honor the people that we remember with our, with our uh, poinsettia offerings to offer it to people who need more than a poinsettia. They need a house or a table to put it on or, or whatever. And that, that's a terrible thing that they've been going through. And so our National Association of Congregational Christian Churches designated this Sunday for one great hour of sharing for tornado relief. But maybe we're, it seems appropriate that we, that we the, fl the money we would normally have spent for poinsettias would go to help people uh, brighten people's lives. So I'm, I'm assuming that we'll go forward and do that. Are there other concerns or prayers that we need? Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Merciful God, on this second day of Christmas, we assemble in your presence, reminding ourselves and being reminded by your word that you have called us to live in this world as your children. To live alongside of your presence in the person of Jesus. We pray that you would strengthen us to continue that journey with Jesus through this world. We are mindful that our love for you will be reflected in how we love our neighbors in need. We think of those who are hospitalized and those who are recovering and those who are struggling with, with natural disaster and personal grief and personal issues. We pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit into our lives and that you would strengthen us as we begin to understand more fully who you created us to be and how you have offered yourself to lead us into a life of wholeness. We pray for this whole created order that we might learn how to live together as peoples and raise our voices of praise with the natural order, the beauty that we see around us in the trees and the mountains in the ocean. Let our lives sparkle, that they might enlighten the lives of those who are walking in darkness. And merciful God, hear the prayers that well from deep within each one of us that we are unable to put into words. But in the silence, merciful God, through the ears of your spirit, hear the prayers that dwell deep within each of us.
These prayers we raise to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, opportunities for service are during for this coming week are uh, limited. Uh, no, Bible study is still on. That's the one. That's the one. That's right. So, <laughs> they voted to come and assume that Maggie would be there to lead us. But Bible study is a very Maggie's been leading uh, a discussion of the women. Uh, now in the New Testament, we we got somewhere in the early part of the Old Testament looking at the women in the Bible, and and, and especially during this this uh, Christmas season, the women in the Bible have become more prominent in our lives. We we began with uh, Elizabeth, uh, the mother of, of John the Baptist, and Mary, who who is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and and as we go along with with the various women as we go through, understanding that, that without that loving relationship of the mothers of this world, that the world would be a much darker place. And so it's very interesting to, to kind of work your way into God's word in the Bible through, through the lives and the eyes and the understanding uh, and the prayers that we read of the women in the Bible. So we thank Maggie for continuing that. And choir practice. Choir practice on Wednesday night. Yes. Okay. And I think that's it for this week. Yes. Yep. And, and let us then turn to our closing hymn, number 134, There's a Song in the Air.
bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Amen.